At the end of the 1990s, economists were making the claim that the economic boom of the 1990s was trickling down to the most disadvantaged segments of the population. And that was extremely hard to reconcile with a growing criminal justice system that was disproportionately affecting young African American men, especially those with low levels of education, who probably wouldn't have done very well in the labor market had they been in the labor market. Well, it turns out an increasing fraction of them weren't in the labor market, they were in prison or jail. We know that one in 100 American adults is incarcerated, but how is incarceration, specifically imprisonment, concentrated among those with the lowest levels of education? We measured the lifetime risk of imprisonment, which is what are the chances that within a sociodemographic group, say among young black men who've dropped out of high school, what are the chances that they would spend at least a year in prison by the time they reach age 35. It turns out it's very hard to estimate the lifetime risk of imprisonment because most of our federal data collection uh, systems don't ask questions about incarceration. We don't ask people when they're 35, were you incarcerated? What we do is we create what's a, called a synthetic cohort. The data are collected from the Bureau of Justice Statistics and they do surveys of inmates periodically every few years. But we use those data to construct the number of people who were imprisoned in the last year for the first time of different ages, races, genders, and educational groups. So we create, in some ways, a hypothetical population of people born in a given year, say 1965 to 1969, and we then expose them to those age-specific risks year by year. And we were particularly interested in comparing the risks of spending at least a year in prison for people born between 1945 and 49 who came of age before the growth of the criminal justice system in the, U in the U.S., with those born between 1965 and 1969 who came of age during the height of the prison boom. For cohorts born between 1965 and 1969, among white men who went to college, the lifetime risk of being in prison was virtually zero. Among black men who've gone to college, the risks are relatively low, about one in 10 young white men who didn't finish high school would spend at least a year in prison. But among black men who dropped out of high school, the lifetime risk was 60%. So one of the key findings in this work is not just that there's racial inequality and exposure to the criminal justice system, but that there's educational inequality and that that educational inequality has grown dramatically over time. Conventional statistics, like the current population survey, would estimate that about half of young black men without a high school diploma are employed on a given day. But if you include those who are incarcerated, what you find is it's a quarter. You actually find that among young black men who've dropped out of high school, they are more likely to be incarcerated on any given day than they are to be employed. I don't think that we can understand social inequality without attending to the criminal justice system. It's become such an important institution in the lives of young black men. It rivals higher education, it rivals the military, it rivals marriage. Most scholars agree that the massive buildup in, in the criminal justice system in the U.S. has not been due to widespread changes in crime or criminality, but instead it's been attributed to shifts in policy, policing, and prosecution that disproportionately affect those with low levels of education. So one remedy is to think about potential changes to the criminal justice system itself, alternatives to custodial sentences. Another important avenue is to focus on education. Investing in K-12 education, particularly in disadvantaged communities, would certainly target those populations most at risk of spending time ultimately in prison or jail.